representatives of the high-level group who worked on uh, this excellent report. Uh, and I think we are starting uh, a half-day workshop uh, with the objective to uh, look actually at deliberations of the high-level group. Now, uh, I, I, I had the privilege to get the report uh, just a couple of days ago from Broer. I went through it, and I think it's really a uh, mind-opening report. I think it's extremely innovative, and I should be very frank with you, because we are, we are home here. Uh, I, I didn't expect that I would get some kind of uh, this kind of innovative and open approach when I was, uh, uh, when I was reading it. I, I was expecting to get you know, a traditional report, conservative, these are things which we are doing right, these are things which could be done better, but I think this is really innovative and open and, and, and new way of thinking on, on, uh, uh, on the innovation. And when I talk about innovation, I think innovation at large. Uh, now, looking at where we stand as European Commission, of course, when we get, when we get this kind of reports, first of all, it's uh, to some extent a mirror to us. Uh, you know, you read it and then you think, what should we do better? What we should do commission better? But uh, we should note that it's not targeting only the EU policies, but it's much, much broader. Uh, so I, I was looking at what we are doing now in European Commission and what we used to be doing in the past. And I noted um, a, a big changes which we had from the seven framework program to Horizon 2020. As you uh, know very well, in the seven framework program uh, and previous programs, we had to some extent innovation uh, just as a kind of add-on to the research. Uh, largely, it was fo uh, the, the innovation was focused to some extent on some kind of piloting. Uh, very often we try to promote innovation with, uh, under the umbrella of dissemination and use of the results, but innovation as embedding it from the beginning in, um, in our work, uh, we were far away from that. Now I think with Horizon 2020, I think things changed quite a lot compared to the past. Uh, but uh, reading the report, I, I was very happy and very proud with, with uh, Horizon 2020, and I think we are collectively very proud with what we have in Horizon 2020. We have a good balance between uh, um, roadmap-based research, which is de facto aiming towards boosting innovation uh, in, in uh, industry and through that supporting European growth and jobs. But also I think uh, we have uh, uh, quite a wealth of opportunity for new innovative ideas coming through different open and disruptive schemes of which, which we are supporting uh, in, in uh, Horizon 2020. But as I said, looking and reading the report I was wondering, are we there yet? And uh, I should be quite frank, probably not. Probably with this report, with looking at uh, the suggestions and recommendations, especially those which are looking at the public sector uh, uh, research and innovation, I think uh, uh, we should reflect about how to, to adopt, how to take some of the recommendations on board and what should be done uh, on our side as well. Uh, but as I said, the report is much broader than just the European uh, research and innovation landscape, European Commission uh, work. But uh, I think for me it was also a pleasure to uh, try to understand uh, the implications this report could have on national uh, research and innovation policies. So innovation policies uh, of uh, EU member states and beyond. Uh, so I think from that perspective, as I said, uh, the report of the high-level group, as you know very well, has start, uh, the work has started during um, uh, Polish presidency. Uh, a lot of work has been done. It, uh, the the, the uh, Irish presidency was extremely supportive. Uh, now I think uh, I was reading the, the for, uh, foreword of uh, uh, Italian ministry, minister, and she was also very supportive of the report. So I think now we are we, we finally have it. It's a second stage of uh, second step of the report, uh, and we should uh, use this workshop to to share the experience, look at the recommendations, look at the suggestions, uh, but also what what I discussed uh, earlier uh, was actually how to how to engage other relevant stakeholders in uh, uh, you know bringing the messages from the report to the wider stakeholders. First of all, within the Commission, meaning beyond uh, usual suspects, which, is, uh, which are DG R RTD, uh, DG Connect, DG Enterprise, uh, how we can raise the attention to our political masters. Uh, because uh, let me just remind you the expectations which you heard from uh, President Juncker 
uh, on mid of July are extremely high and we'll have a lot of work to do in this respect. Uh, we are looking at Katainen package. Uh, so I think in this respect, it will be very important to, to look how we can engage relevant stakeholders, first of all, within the commission, raise it to the political level. Second thing, I think it's very important to see uh, how we can talk with the presidency in order to maybe repeat the uh, presentation which was done already on uh, informal competitiveness council during Irish presidency and maybe have now another go to the political masters in the member states. And also I think uh, it will be important to, to see how to engage all the other stakeholders, most notably from the private sector, in order that this will not be just one of reports, uh, but this would be de facto the report for what it was actually targeting at the beginning, and that is to contribute to really reshaping the European and member states' uh, industrial policies at large. So uh, please take the best out of this opportunity of this workshop. Uh, I will unfortunately have to excuse myself and leave in about 20 minutes from now, but Broad will be here, and uh, of course there are a number of heads of units here who will participate in the discussion, so let's take the best out of it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Director General, for your kind words and your encouragement of the work uh, we have done in this peculiar group. Um, our work was based on an advice I got very early in my uh, career from the former Dutch Prime Minister Van Acht, who said, young man, you must learn how far you can go too far and still be relevant <coughs> to decision makers. This inspired us because, as you rightly pointed out, the Commission and many governments over the last few years have developed a variety of initiatives in the field of innovation policy. And our task was to look at them as a system. How hang they together? How support they each other? Which are the potential feedbacks, the cross-fertilization between what Brussels does and what capitals do? And how can we give some advice which is helpful to the people who have already done so much and clearly want to do even more? And even more is needed if you look at the not so favorable economic position of Europe and not so favorable competitiveness position of Europe. So when this initiative was launched by the Polish presidency in uh, 2011, we really thought also about Hillary Clinton's words, never waste a good crisis. But then the question arises, what to do? Sometimes with minor crises in a company or a country, you replace the management or you replace the government, and that's it. But if you have a systemic crisis as a result of deep technological changes <coughs> driven by digitalization, that won't be enough. You really have to start looking at system change, and that's not so easy. So how to deal with the new economic and social paradigms, how to deal with the old versus the emerging uh, systems, that requires what was actually the request of the Polish government to think outside the box. The mandate we got as a group says exactly that. We ask you to think outside the box. And then, of course, comes the the risk that you think outside the box but are no longer relevant to decision makers, mm -hmm. that you behave like a think tank, um, you write a beautiful report, but you and your colleagues cannot do much with it. 
And I think that we were able, listening to you and to some other comments we were fortunate to receive, we were able to avoid that risk by designing of work, no, sorry, <laughs> by designing an innovative methodology. First of all, <coughs> we, the group was not working with an official commission or a government mandate. The group was a semi-public, private, semi-official, public-private partnership, temporary also. And we brought on board experts from a number of national governments, and we chose these countries on the basis of one criteria, that is their innovation policy models. And in the group, you have governments representing highly developed innovation policy models till the lower end of the scale where there is almost no policy management. Then we brought on board a number of companies who in the market are seen as innovative companies, innovation leaders. And they were invited and told very clearly that if they participated, this was for the public good and there was to be no lobbying. And I'm happy to say they all respected that. The third part was the academic side. In order to avoid to get a public-private sector discussion, we brought academics on board, independent experts as well. So the first meeting was indeed a bit confusing. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. But then gradually something important was happening. In this group, trust emerged between the various members. And over the past two years, this basic trust allowed open discussions and allowed an alignment of views so that in the end the report is not a report of governments or business or academics it has a consensus view consensus does not mean that each one has exactly literally agreed with each recommendation but the package yes and this method of a tripartite independent group close to decision makers but with people operating in their own name and therefore under Chatham House rules, I think this methodology is something which uh, was truly helpful in achieving the outcome which we had over the past two years together with, I must repeat, the support we got from the various governments participating, the companies participating, but certainly also from within the Commission. And in particular, the three participating DGs, Research, Connect and Enterprise, and the Chief Science Advisor. Something else which should be mentioned in this respect, that in between the official meetings of the group, we had a lot of bilateral meetings among the members and with members and the steering team of the high-level group. The Polish government, having a Catholic background, called that the confession series. <laughs> and these talks were indeed very useful as well because they allowed to have inputs in addition to the collective discussions and allowed to the process of alignment to continue in between the meetings. So the first idea which we came up with was that we do not need to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot in member states, there is a lot in Brussels happening in the field of innovation policy. It may not always have the right label but it is innovation policy. It is innovative thinking. So we saw ourselves, I think I may say so, as a sort of friendly coach for those who are already developing ideas, and you mentioned Horizon 2020, and there are a lot of others, uh, which are really the seeds, the first steps of a comprehensive innovation policy. 
And this is the word which I would like us to reflect a moment on, and which is the reason why we spend so much time on developing this concept of an innovation ecosystem. That is to achieve more added value out of the individual commission or national initiatives, one needs to see them in a more coherent, more systemic way so that they produce added value, they produce cross-fertilization for each other. This is where perhaps in the European Union we have to learn from successful innovative economies, be they Switzerland or Southeast Asia or some member states indeed. Policy coherence. Policy coherence within the governance system and indeed with innovation leaders in industry, all sectors combined, and in the research community, be they independent research organizations, institutions, uh, as you have in some countries, a TNO in the Netherlands, Fraunhofer and others in Germany, etc., or be they universities themselves. And so we were working on this concept of an innovation ecosystem and say, look, let's have, let's see how an ecosystem operates as a coherent system and how bringing more coherence and togetherness in these various initiatives already existing, new initiatives to be developed, how we can move towards a really European ecosystems. We, we, it's single here, but we always use this as a plural, European and national. And how these ecosystems should overlap and co work together. So it's not just the EU, it's also member states. And in fact, we must be realistic. Um, there is a, a, a problem there with 28 member states. Because when you look at it from an innovation point of view, and allow me to be frank in your building, uh, you have three groups. You have a core group of member states which have various degrees of advanced innovation policy making and where we can all take inspiration from. And you find them back in your own innovation scoreboard and even better in independent innovation rankings. You have a group of governments who are aware that they have to do it and are now struggling to get innovation policy going. And unfortunately, you have a group of laggards which are still in the process of discovering that this is necessary for their economies and for their long-term future. So here, we like to think, and we say somewhere in one of the recommendations, it's really the Commission, as it is responsible for the single market, should take a close look at these emerging gaps, at these, sorry, widening gaps between innova innovative economies and, 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 and the laggards. Mm -hmm. Because this will put a severe strain over the coming years on the working of the single market with all the consequences of that. And this is very important because business no longer thinks in national market terms. One of the gr many successes of the EU is that we have this single market. Yes, still a little bit incomplete, but we have a single market. As a result, not just large multinationals, but all also innovative startup companies, they think in European market terms, if not in global market terms. And unfortunately, governments often think, too often think, in national context, in national market terms, which no longer exist. So there is here more a conceptual, almost a mental problem than as well as a systemic, as an as organizational and procedural problem. And therefore, we think that we have to, to really look at this, how to overcome that, and how to develop a, a, a special coaching effect uh, to help these, these companies. Now, we were asked by the Irish presidency 
after the concept of the innovation ecosystem to actually elaborate that. And they said, yeah, that's fine. We understand it. But now we want something more concrete. Uh, Commissioner Gagan Quinn, who was at the meeting, and several of the ministers said, give us a blueprint for reforms. We may not do it, one of them said honestly, but at least give us a blueprint. What we should do, what we could do. And this was the work with the members started in the second phase of the group under Irish and Italian guidance. And I've made, we, my, my, we had the benefit of an independent research team, a couple of the members are here, and we had, we, we made an attempt now to actually link the main recommendations together and to show how none of these recommendations should be seen in isolation. And this I would like to emphasize. If you read the various, if you ever read that paper on a rainy Sunday afternoon, all the recommendations hang together. And with this scheme, we try to show you this. The tick lines are key lines. The other ones are other are important linkages as well. And, and let me take an example what we mean with this, the concept of impact assessments. I deliberately chose this because I know it's a hotly debated political issue. If you look at impact assessments on its own, it is indeed a political issue. And the Commission has made great advances about it, no doubt. But we do not have impact assessment throughout the decision-making chain, throughout the co-decision system. We don't have it at further stages. We only have it at the start. We also don't have it after uh, regulation has come to the market. <laughs> Seeing this in isolation, in isolation is impossible to solve because you have a too great diversity of opinion. However, one should not see this in isolation. It is part of collaborative governance between commission, government, stakeholders. It is part of policy coherence. It is the, the start, the, the basis for better regulation. So all these objectives hang together. The same goes for social innovation. Uh, the same goes for um, uh, competitiveness recommendations. You cannot talk about IPR in isolation if you don't look at the, what in the digital economy is so important, co-creation. If you don't look at how business and university research are actually have to be stimulated for in order to catch up with uh, say, or main competitors of Southeast Asia or, or the United States. And then the concept of mutuality takes a new meaning of joint research, joint uh, long-term strategies, public policies aligned with uh, key business strategies and vice versa. This does not just mean that we, we need change in thinking um, on the public side, I, I was invited for a similar presentation last week in the European Roundtable of Industrialists. I made it quite clear to them, we all have to change. And, and uh, all these leading business people were, were nodding, in fact. That doesn't mean that we have a miracle solution, but at least the minds are evolving, and that is the fortunate um, situation in which we are. So please consider our recommendations, not in isolation, but as part of building this ecosystem, the interdependence between them, and how we move away in an ecosystem from the classic linear thinking in a industrial type economy between cause and effect, to something which will be the great challenge, if I may say so, as an independent outsider, thinking outside the box, uh, the great challenge for the European institutions, particularly the Commission, will be complexity management in the future. To move away from hierarchical-based linear thinking leading to regulation to managing complexity in the European single market and to managing interdependencies between sectors, between public policy and private strategies 
uh, between the objectives of various stakeholders. No one has miracle answers for it, but we have at least started thinking about it, and um, together with uh, governments, commission, business, and academia, I think this process of thinking, should, uh, which we try to launch, uh, should now continue. And this is why we also say this report is a contribution to the market of ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Linda van Duivenbode. I'm uh, from the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs. Thank you, Broer and uh, Stefan, for organizing this meeting uh, and inviting me to uh, uh, share my experience of the high-level working group with you today. <clears throat> um, it certainly, as Stefan said, um, uh, was a very enjoyable process, uh, not only because of the excellent uh, venues we visited and the uh, uh, very, very, very good meals we had uh, most recently in Italy, but most, most of all because of the the company of the very various participants, and the um, the discussions we had and the ideas we shared and the energy you get from meetings such as those. So thank you also for the for taking the initiatives to bringing the group together in the first place. Um, I was given a subject for today, the role of science for policy making, uh, but then luckily Boer said to me that I was allowed to uh, broaden the subject uh, uh, to share my own experiences with you. Um, so I have taken that liberty. I will come back to the role of science, and you see on the slide I've um, noted some, some tags and keywords that I think are very uh, topical at the moment. Um, one of them is the article I saw yesterday about the chief scientific advisor role and the fact that uh, Mr. Juncker hasn't yet announced or decided what he's going to do with this role. Um, uh, certainly science and science communication and the media were, I would, it's probably fair to say, were the most heated debate in the group. I mean, most of us, we, you know, we're all sensible people and we kind of come from the same background and share similar ideas. But that was definitely a very heated debate with very different opinions. So I will come back to that at the end. But I'll share some experiences with you first. And I've stuck to topics um, that stuck with me most of all, that resonated with my own um, idea. So by no means they are a comprehensive overview of all the elements that are in the report. So first of all, um, the title of the report, the blueprint, Inspiring and Completing the European Innovation Ecosystems. Um, in the group discussions, there was agreement quite early on when we started thinking about well, what is it we want to achieve in Europe? Where, where should this work? Where should innovation and competitiveness lead to? Uh, it was quite quickly agreed that we want to work towards or maintain a European model. And by this I mean um, sustainable economic progress, but coupled with societal well-being and welfare and um, reducing, our, it's probably fair to say, inequality uh, at the moment, something Mariana Mazzucato uh, is going to speak about in um, a speech she's giving as, as part of a, a, a prize she's won, rising inequality. So definitely uh, the, the, the quote that's in the foreword of the, the blueprint uh, quote on it, it's, it's optimize the benefits of research and investment for European jobs, growth, and society. Um, we agreed it should be building on and using Europe's cultural diversity as a strength. Um, however, we also concluded that this model needs to be paid for. It needs to be affordable. 
And of course, this is where we struggle at the moment. So we have to be brave, as Per Sandberg from Stadtoral said. We also have to <coughs> be brave enough to innovate our welfare systems if that's necessary. And I think we are definitely in that phase now. Also, we um, agreed amongst each other that innovation, it's also said in the report, is a tool, a tool for competitiveness and addressing societal challenge. Sometimes innovation is now seen as a means, uh, as a goal in itself, but I think we very much saw it as a, as a means to an end. Um, the mandate of the group was um, competitiveness to start, but because of this European model and inclusiveness and, and equality, um, we also broadened the scope to, to social innovation, so we, we touched upon those aspects as well. But the main focus remained competitiveness, and that's where we started the, the, the report uh, in terms of how we wrote it down or how uh, the secretariat and the research team wrote it down. Um, during the first phase of the high-level group, we agreed that Europe has excellent science, uh, and we have great ideas. I mean, there's no lack of people with great ideas for improving uh, uh, Europe, for improving our, our lives, for uh, competitive and economic ideas. But we really need to focus more on impact. Um, and we seem to have lost in Europe this entrepreneurial spirit. We discussed that even during the crisis, um, th there is this feeling in Europe that we're doing okay, whereas I think in other regions of the world it's seen that there is more of a, an urgency, a sense of urgency, uh, dynamism that we, we seem to have somehow lost uh, in Europe. So that's something we discuss, we really should focus on getting back. Uh, and this goes for both enterprise and policy making. So I think innovation of the, policy, the, the government systems and our own policy is just as necessary as, as, as businesses and, and startups and, and, and those kind of things. Um, one of the companies I worked for in the past used a slogan for a while that said, no guts, no glory. Um, so I think also that this aspect of you have to, be, you have to dare to take a risk. And it could, you could fail, but you know, it could also be a, a great success. But you have to try. Uh, I'm actually not sure if the company is still in existence. Um, and I'm not sure if that was for lack of guts or too much guts, but that's the way it goes. Um, we talked about, of course, regulation. Uh, European regulation, so much seen as a barrier for doing business in Europe and outside Europe. And it struck me that industry, the in industry that participated, didn't necessarily want less regulation, but they really wanted better regulation. Um, some even said that regulation had, had pushed them to newer standards in energy efficiency that they wouldn't have done without EU regulation. So there definitely wasn't a plea from industry to abolish regulation, but they felt that a lot of regulation these days is sort of conflicting, and, and, and we touched upon it in the governance model, and the, the way we've organized government and create new policy and regulation that starts to conflict. Um, but it also touched, touched upon regulation that um, didn't really take account of, of the modern economy that we're in, the digital economy that we're in, the, the changed values. You know, a lot of the legislation in Europe was created in, an, in the beginning of an industrial era. Um, the EU was a very small, there were about 10 member states. It was manageable, now with 28 member states. Um, really was felt that we need to take a look at, for example, competition law. We, we need for, for, uh, to stay in business, we, re we need to collaborate in research and development. Um, and, and yet competition law sometimes sees public-private partnerships as forming cartels or monopolies. So we really need to look at modernizing our legislative systems, or, or at least the way we apply the existing legislation. And of course, um, as Stefan already mentioned, uh, top priority, certainly for the Netherlands in EU uh, negotiations, is always 
single market, single market, single market. It has to work because creating a, a European market is is the, the basis for a European industri industry to start. Like Stefan said, they, they quite quickly want to branch out to the rest of the world, but they have to have a home basis. We have to give them a home basis to start because otherwise we're just gonna lose them straight away. And the exciting topic of governance, how do you manage policy in uh, Europe with a complex system. I looked uh, at Google images for uh, a picture of innovation ecosystems, and this one made me smile because I seem to remember that in an earlier draft of the report, this picture was used mm -hmm. and it was dismissed mm -hmm. by, um, by the group, uh, some of the academics as being messy and not really representative and not being um, clear on what an innovation ecosystem really is. So I thought I'll put this one in because maybe that's maybe that's just the way it is. You know, maybe innovation is a uh, Europe is messy. Policy is messy because it is at so many levels and it is top down and bottom up. And how do we organize it? Well, from a personal point of view, I haven't been so keen on um, the top down. The idea that top down from Europe you can uh, organize the governance of innovation policy uh, in Europe. Uh, this idea of an overarching person, body, whatever it is, because it does take place in so many different um, nooks and crannies of Europe. And um, I put down sort of more the var variable geometry. Maybe in 28 member states and the Commission, it's an illusion to think that all of us uh, will be heading in the same direction at the same moment in time. So maybe we do need more flexible uh, working systems, mm -hmm. but not across the old lines of north, east, south, west, like we tend to do, but ideally, of course, across regions. So, you know, I could very well see the Netherlands working with Estonia uh, because they are very forward looking and have <coughs> great digital systems that we're, we are lagging behind uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, we also discussed the innovation divide and, and, and seeing this as a concern um, because there's so much going on around Europe right now and Europe as a, as a continent uh, to stay competitive in the world. If we break apart as Europe, this was really felt would be you know, disastrous for, for each individual member state and, and the, the group as a whole. So this is something we're going to have to pay attention to in the next few years to, to get the whole of Europe um, uh, at a higher level and competing in, in the global economy. Um, continuity is important. So I think uh, the EU and the Commission with the seven-year programming cycle tend to fare better than that in than, uh, the national systems sometimes do, which have shorter uh, political cycles. Uh, an example is that in the Netherlands we used to have innovation programs. Um, 2010 with the, the then new government they were terminated. Uh, they were criticized by our independent advisory councils for being ineffective. Uh, and a colleague of mine told me a few weeks ago that she went to the closing conference of, of one of the innovation uh, programs related to health and they were showing all sorts of new products and startup companies and services that had come out of this program. So what I want to say with this is um, it, takes, it takes some time. It takes some time for policy to mature, to, to have an impact, and we, we must measure impact. But we also have to give it time to, uh, to create that impact. Um, and in that respect, we very much welcomed the, commission, the communication that was issued by DG Research and Innovation and DG ECFIN together on uh, research and innovation as sources of renewed growth because it addressed th the need to look at the quantity and the quality of national and uh, EU research systems. And uh, we've been trying to convince our Treasury colleagues uh, and our central planning agency that calculates the, uh, the government programs each, uh, each government cycle that really investment in research and innovation should be taken into account when you look at the, the spending by a government because um, evidence shows that 
it works. It, you know, it, it may not be within the, the scope of four years, but if you don't do it, then you definitely fall behind. Uh, in terms of governance, the other issue we discovered were the silos. Uh, 28 member state, 28 commissioners, lots of commission services, national government. Of course, everyone wants to come up with their own policy. Uh, and it has to be new because, it, you know, once you've done it, it's no longer interesting. And this is driving everyone crazy because uh, from a national policymaker point of view, already um, I struggle to keep track of the initiatives that are being launched. And for startups, it's impossible to keep track of them. Where do you go? What do you have to deal with? Um, so, on a positive note, I think it's very encouraging that the new Juncker, Juncker Commission um, has started to work with clusters, policy clusters, um, and, and hopefully that will cut through some of the, the silos that are existing. And it's not, it's not a negative comment towards the Commission per se, because of course at national level we have exactly the same mm -hmm. with our government departments. Um, I think one of the other aspects we touched upon, and it has a bit to do with the entrepreneurial spirit, that as a Europe, we need to start inspire again. We, we, we don't have any grand projects that we, we can be proud of. I mean, Europe is, as a project, Europe is, is now sort of in, in the public eye. It's lost its, its, um, its gloss. Everyone's used to living in a peaceful, relatively prosperous environment. What, what, what is Europe nowadays? <coughs> um, we discussed something like Airbus or uh, the Eurotunnel, but I think we should look for something more inspirational. Um, like, for example, I don't know if you're aware, but today the European Space Agency uh, has, um, will, will land. We, we are being positive here. Uh, the Philae lander on, on the comet. This is, I mean, in talking of inspiration, but also long-term planning, this has been 20 years in the making, launched 10 years ago. Uh, the Rosetta mission has been circling the, the comet, and today, this morning, the, the lander was, uh, was released and is now on its way to the comet, should land there at half past six. We'll hear it half an hour later because of the distance uh, to Earth. Um, and already when you look on uh, Twitter, it's a trending topic. And, you know, it, it, it captures the imagination of people. Uh, so Concorde or a mission to the moon or whatever. But we need to give inspiration again in Europe. So coming back to the topic and the first sheet. Policy making based on scientific evidence. That's what we all want. Impact assessments should be strengthened, of course. But policy making is very much also based on political and societal influences. And, you know, we can't get away from it. So I, however much um, one would like to have um, policy based on science alone, uh, it's not going to happen. So the question I posed here, who, who do we trust? There's two articles there. One is from uh, plant researchers in GM who have sent a letter uh, pleading the European Parliament, Parliament not to block legislation that would allow more trials. And the other one is from a Dutch newspaper that says um, that with the, the new uh, outcome of the US Congress and Senate, Republican-based, we might as well shelve the climate treaty because that now there's no way uh, we're going to get any treaty ratified by the U.S. because they'll just block anything that's being put on the table. Is it based on science? I would say no, but there you go. That's the way it is. So this is one of the discussions uh, we had uh, in our group. Science, evidence, communication, and media. Uh, and this is where we had the, uh, the debate because increasingly with digital communication, people are uh, interacting, they're spreading ideas. Uh, the media um, we, was criticized in the group for, for headlining, um, you know, sort of vaccination disaster, and then the article doesn't list disasters at all, but the headline's already done the damage. 
Um, and who do people trust? Is it, it's no longer business, it's no longer government, it's no longer science. Do we trust each other? I mean, certainly when I uh, look for something, I go online. When I look for a holiday, I don't go to a travel agent and ask them which destinations they like. I go to TripAdvisor and see how many views or reviews certain, certain destinations had. And, and then I trust the crowd, basically. Um, so communication was seen perhaps as one of the most important elements uh, for innovation, because if we can't communicate what we do, why we do it, how we do it, how do we get acceptance of innovation, which can be painful and disruptive, destroy jobs, um, be, be risky, how do we do it? Um, so I think there was agreement on the need for communication, but there certainly wasn't agreement on the roots on how we should do it, how do we communicate. There, was, there were ideas that we should proactively target the media to counter some of those claims that were being made. Mm, not always very, weren't popular with everyone. Sort of, are we gonna then lobby or put a spin on uh, information ourselves? Um, and for me, I'm just gonna speak on a personal basis now, it, it has to be openness and transparency. Um, put the information out there, um, make it available and, and I would probably, at the moment, put the most trust in the crowd, uh, more than sort of any individual expert. Uh, and I think this 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 applies to uh, to our to our own work at national level, but um, I think it applies to the work programs of the Commission. I think it applies to whoever sits on the program committees for Horizon 2020. Why should this be a secret? I'm I'm a civil servant, you know. I'm I should be in the public domain. Uh, I think also it should apply to the uh, uh, TTIP, to the trade agreements. Um, and it should also apply to scientific information. So we're a, bit, a big advocate for open access to scientific publications right now. Um, so the information becomes available not just to other scientists, but also to the public at large to read and to form their own opinions. Um, Finally, uh, there was a mission included in the, uh, in the report. I posted the, uh, this seminar on uh, LinkedIn and my uh, participation here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only had one reaction and it was kind of, well, same old, same old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the person who read it said, nothing seems to change. So I guess um, it's up to us to make a change. Once again, I welcome the, the focus that the Juncker Commission seems to place on getting work done. Don't invent new stuff already. Stefan said it, there's so much going on already. Get the work done. And um, my invitation to you is join the mission. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Linda. Are there any quick questions re related to, to Linda's view of angle? John, please. Yeah, I'm just interested in the, your issue of communication. So you said we're going to, we must persuade people that innovation is terribly important, even though it will be painful, risky, and destroy jobs. If I were the people, I'd say let's not do it. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. I mean, we seem to have lived through the most innovative period in Europe for the last 25 years. We seem to be destroying jobs at an extraordinary rate and your recipe seems to be a new form of the innovation that caused the problem in the first place. I mean, why not stop? Because the, the rest of the world won't. <coughs> Close the borders. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if this is a serious uh, comment. Have you been watching the news recently? Have you have you heard what's happened to the USSR or to the Eastern Bloc? Yeah, I think they're in charge of our oil and gas. <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah, I suppose we could. I, I don't believe that would work. I don't believe, certainly not having uh, lived through a Europe that we are accustomed to. Um, I don't think it would, it would bring us forward if we close the borders. And I don't think people would accept it anymore. 
an idea. Well, thank you, John, for, for that comment, and I suppose you will continue that during the aftermath of, of the, the event. Uh, well, we move now to Suzanne, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Bro, and also thank you and Stefan for organizing this, this event. My name is Susanne Burger. I am Director of European Affairs in the German Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, I was in Brussels for quite a long time, 12 years all in all, and before I took the post of director, I was in the perm rep. So I'm really happy to be back in Brussels every time I'm here. I only can echo what Stefan and Linda said about the group that we had the privilege to be a, a member of. And I think Linda uh, put it in an excellent way to describe our discussions, where we came from, and, and on the one hand how difficult it was, on the other hand how fruitful it was, and where we could all agree upon. So, and I must say for me personally, it was a big chance because in Germany since 2007, we have this kind of high-tech innovation strategy that we want constantly to, that has constantly to be renewed. And during the last year, we uh, put a new um, effort to renew this high-tech strategy. And so I could very well with my colleagues in the ministry discuss the things that we discussed in the high-level group. And it was nice to see the reactions because one of the, some of the ideas that we created in the high-level group, they were never thought of in Germany. So I must say this was a real good experience. And uh, I, I would be, if it had not been stopped, I would have liked to continue. <laughs> okay. So my subject today um, is about talking about uh, science and industrial policy that was given, but I would rather talk about cooperation between science and industry, science and uh, business and science and economics, because when you look at the recommendations of the high-level group after page 16, most of them re relate to cooperation between science and business, and also if you look at the priorities of the European <coughs> research area, then you see that one of the priorities is transfer from scientific results to the private sector. And this is a subject, I think, that's so important for most of member states. As Stefan said in the beginning, and, and Linda, we don't have a problem with excellent science, we have a problem with transfer and uh, putting scientific results into the market. So I'll concentrate on this. My approach is just to throw to you some keywords and um, let's say uh, illustrate them with some examples from my country and also sometimes I have doubts if that's true what we think and so just to enhance the discussion a bit. Let's start with the first one. Are science and business science and economy natural partners? And um, also in the group we started that there is a clear indication that economic growth is related to steady and continuing investments in R&D. And when you look at the innovation leaders in the innovation scoreboard, those are the countries that normally also put a lot of investments in, in R&D. Second, uh, we see a strong involvement of the private sector in R&D. When I look at my country, roughly 80 billion euros were spent on R&D in Germany in 2012, and two-thirds of this funds was coming from the private sector and one-third from public funds. So um, everyone would think it would be a good idea to put those two funds more closely together and, and bring science and economy together in a kind of natural, uh, let's say, feeling that um, only in collaborating we, sh we could come to uh, better results and better economic results. And um, I just was thinking, if it's so evident, if it's so clear that there should be a close cooperation, uh, is it true in reality? And I'm sure many of you are very, very experienced in projects or whatever in cooperating with industry, but when you look at it on a broader scale, I would like to mention that what I've um, discovered in the last weeks where I traveled to seven European countries and six and including Israel as a seventh country, I noticed that trust and transparency are two words that uh, we should look upon because my experience, and it might be personal, but perhaps um, there are others who can share this experience. Uh, when it comes to governments treating topics like skills, like workplaces of the future, like research, you often notice that they 
think that they are the ones who have the knowledge and that they are the ones that can decide and uh, bring plans up uh, to, to, to politics. And uh, I mean, in Germany, we have quite an, a long experience of a more uh, cooperative approach in including regional levels, uh, business trade units, and so on. And when we asked our bilateral partners, please, in our bilateral working groups, include other ministries, include the regional levels, industry and trade unions, it was very difficult. And to be very frank, we didn't manage in one country to have those sitting around. So my plea is that we create platforms if we talk about uh, subjects that closely relate to interests of business, interests of uh, people, interests of whatever, because if we don't have transparency of who is doing what, and if we don't have a trust that the other parties have the same say as we, government for example, it will be very difficult to uh, create coherent policies. And um, what uh, we would like to see is that, that the concept of that we have in this tripartite platform, the high level group, could be opened up to lots of, uh, let's say, occasions. And when you, when you talk about higher education nowadays, you can't only include universities and, and acad academia. You have to think about the labor market and you have to, where, uh, what are, are you teaching about? Where will your students end up? You have to care for this. So my plea is create trust and transparency by involving all stakeholders and by, by just um, creating platforms where those people can meet and, and talk. This is a precondition for successful co collaboration. And I will give one example now, skills and training for, uh, for, that's I think a very good example. And it will, it touches upon that what Alberto will, uh, will say afterwards, but I'll try to give a very concrete example uh, in the German debate. Um, the current discussion about high unemployment, especially of young people, has of course intensified the, the debate about having the right skills for future work and for future uh, also industrial production. And one of the ways to obtain those right skills, whatever, however you define them, is closer cooperation of educational institutions at all levels with the world of work. And um, there is a concept of uh, vocational <coughs> training in Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, and Denmark, and also the Netherlands, where in a quite natural way, business and educational institutions work together. And in Germany, this, this model was transferred to higher education, the so-called dual studies. That means that a com big company or like Bosch, Daimler, or Lidl, or Aldi, they cooperate with the university, and the companies provide the training certificate. Let's say Siemens provides the mechatronic certificate, the vocational one, and the university provides the, bachelor, the engineering bachelor. And what we see is quite astonishing. Young people vote with their feet. Our best school graduates now go to these dual studies. They go to Aldi, Siemens, and wherever, and say, I want to be there. We have subscription rates of one to 1,000 in, in some of these dual studies. And I think universities have to think about why are the best school graduates are going to those, you know, in an academic sense, minor qualification than a master of PhD degree. So this is a very interesting uh, phenomena. And when you read the Spiegel of this week, where they talk about generation Y. That's it's a generation now being 20 or 25, and which is described as being extremely, let's say, rational, and uh, not, not longer hanging for any ideas, but being very practice-oriented, very straight. Then probably it's one of the explanations why these kinds of studies have such a, such a let's say, attractiveness. And so, I, Yes, I want to make things short and say, when you open up education to early co context with the world of work, for example, in schools already, with internships, uh, and also promoting in companies themselves further training, said you might create something what Linda touched upon, entrepreneurial spirit at a very young age. This might help, and also 
that uh, future scientists are already acquainted with the world of work and with business. So this might probably be one of the subjects that uh, could be uh, enhanced further. Also from member states side, of course, but also the commission probably could stir and, and uh, encourage some of these things. Now my fourth subject is concrete examples for university or research organization cooperation with business. And um, I want to highlight some, as we think, useful examples that we experienced in the last year. The first one was launched in 2007, and it's called the Leading Edge Cluster Competition. What we thought uh, that we should take a um, step forward to bring, uh, to build bridges between science and industry, but with a very close view on the regional aspect. And uh, clusters that applied for this competition should be constituted by scientific institutions, um, business, and policymakers. We had three rounds of cluster competitions with all in all 15 clusters to be selected. And we put the money we put in from 2007 till 2017 will be 1.2 billion, 600 million coming from the public funds and 600 million we expect from the business side. And uh, what we found out was that in 2012, when the five-year period for the funding for the first cluster round ended, happily we could notice that they still survived now in 2014. So it was, was not like when public funding ended, it was gone. And um, so we hope that this is a sustainable sustainable project. Um, and uh, what we can see already now, we had an evaluation done, that out of this uh, cluster competition, there were uh, 900 innovations, 300 patents, and nearly 500 uh, PhDs and habilitation theses, and uh, 40 startups out of these 15 clusters. So we think this was quite a Good experience, and what we are doing now is to try to internationalize them, or Europe, to bring this concept into Europe and see if we can find partners for these clusters in other European uh, countries. Another very concrete example for public-private partnership for innovation is recently in 2012, we started with kind of, we call it Forschungscampus, that means research campus. and. Uh, this uh, research campus is not, has not a regional targeting, but um, the aim is to bring uh, research and business very, very close together under one roof. And I remember seeing this in Lausanne, for example. There it already exists. So, for example, a Munich-based company like Siemens should, um, uh, could go to Hamburg University and say, I want to, have a, I want to establish a research campus where really my engineers work together with your scientists under one roof, they eat together, they uh, s uh, do research together, so that they have really a very, very close cooperation. And it's focused on, let's say, how, if, if you can say it like this, basic applied research. The leading edge cluster competition was uh, designed to, to touch upon very cl close to market um, um, uh, research uh, themes, but this um, these research campus uh, uh, focus more on on let's say long term uh, research, and it's also built not for ten but for fifteen years. So we uh, now have ten of these research campuses, and they they will last until uh, until two thousand twenty seven, and they are financed. They have much less finance than the. Uh, leading edge clusters. It's two, two million per year for every research campus. And of course, we expect a high contribution from the business. And uh, we don't have results yet, but we are quite, let's say, confident that these kinds of working together very closely will lead to, to at least um, better understanding this trust business and hopefully better results. Having um, 
talked about these two very uh, practical examples, I would come to my last point, limitations. And uh, I mean, are there limitations to science and uh, business cooperation? Uh, coming back to these very uh, um, practical examples, for the leading edge cluster competition, for example, we saw that this is by no way a kind of, you know, kind of regional spread out or that we can close the gap between strong innovation regions and, and let's say, less innovative regions because most of these leading edge clusters are in the south of Germany where the strong innovation is. So this is not an instrument for any kind of cohesion or whatever. And for politicians, this was a bit difficult because, of course, every of our 16 regional lender thought of having one, and, but competition was uh, uh, clearly gave a different picture. Regarding the Forschungs campus, uh, the question is, if you have only one company working together with, let's say, a university, what does that mean? Will this company take over the whole research subject? Or, um, so what we try to do is that in this research campus, we have several companies, big or smaller ones, so that it's not concentrated too much on the interests of one company. This leads me to the last uh, question, which is more a kind of political or ethical question. Of course, when you look at the, at the discussions in schools and universities, sometimes people say we don't want in companies in school. We don't want sponsoring from companies in schools. We don't want companies to influence what's happening in schools. And the same applies sometimes to universities, where students say, no, we don't want this Aldi chair or we don't want this and this, out of kind of political, ethical, uh, let's say, uh, thinking that academia should be free, that research should be free of influence, everything like this. So we still have this discussion, and we have to take this seriously, I guess, and to make clear that um, this freedom of academia and this freedom of research still is of very high value, even while you foster a very close cooperation between science and industry. And that's my end, and I'm happy to hear your opinions about these. Thank you. Thank you. Any quick question? Yes, please. Introduce yourself as well. Hello, my name is Maria, and I'm a trainee here actually with Broer. Um, I have a question. In Denmark, uh, many companies offer traineeship to students, but you have to be a student. So usually final year. That is fine, so that's promising. What about the people who graduated, finished school, finished university, master's degree usually, sometimes PhD, a couple of years ago, um, and they still can't find a job? They can't um, get traineeship, and they're finding the difficulties in the labor market. What should they do now? Thank you. Um, you mean that uh, those people having stepped out of the system, don't have a possibility to, to get this kind of internships. I mean, uh, it would be a waste of, of talents and a way, waste of, of labor force if, if industry would not uh, come back to those people. And, 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 and. I mean, uh, in a few years, at least in, in our country, we have a big shortage of labor. So I don't think, uh, I, or, or I'm, I hope that those, uh, what you describe in the future, won't happen that much because, because uh, when, we have, uh, when the labor force is shrinking, and it's very fastly shrinking currently. Uh, we have an academic unemployment rate of 2.4 currently in Germany. That means, yeah, and it's in other countries it will be the same. So I don't think that for people having an academic uh, education, uh, the labor market will be closed. So, in, uh, oh, perhaps I didn't get it right, sorry. I'm talking about the unemployed youth in Europe now. I'm talking about myself. I'm talking about a lot of people I know. What should they do? I mean, how should they find their way back into the industry? 
They're not students anymore. Should they go back? What should those people do? Um, I can give you an example. In Germany, about one-fourth of students break up their studies before they take an exam. And uh, what, what our companies are offering currently is having a fast-track vocational certificate instead of three years, doing it in one year or two years. And this is, this is done quite, this is accepted quite well because uh, companies, of course, love people who have a vocational, very practical experience and also an academic background. So I think chances for those people who go back and, and you should not, uh, one should not regard this as a step back. Having, having a vocational training, I'm, I must really say, is not a step back from, it's, it, we try to uh, look at it as, as equal. So that's, that's what we, we would say, uh, tell uh, students if, if the situation really is like this. But it's very different in different countries currently, I must admit. Thank you, I, I think that is a, a good bridge to, to Alberto, who will touch the topic as well, and, and of course the high-level group from, from his perspective. Alberto, please. Thank you, Bror. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can I ask uh, to go back, please, uh, to uh, um, Stefan's slide on uh, the uh, uh, on the presentation on the on the recommendations uh, map? Mm, yes, that one, please. So we we I. I'm not going to use my slides, but I'd like um, you to absorb uh, uh, this picture here because I will refer uh, back and forth to the um, recommendation index. And to anticipate uh, the point where I will uh, end up, uh, um, I think uh, that your question was very timely and it's a very delicate question. And I think uh, <clears throat> the success of an innovation ecosystem in Europe is directly and indirectly to create opportunities for the people that you're mentioning, like you, you know, yourself, uh, me, uh, or people that are like uh, early on in their career or later on in their career. And uh, the final goal of an innovation ecosystem is to fight against uh, I think one of the enemies that is becoming uh, enemy number one in Europe and was mentioned by Suzanne first, and I think it's wasted talent. And if uh, innovation helps in the fight against wasted talent, uh, I think uh, that uh, is, uh, is a key measure. Okay, economic growth and uh, prosperity, GDP, fine, unemployment. But if there is someone, an economist, that is going to help me, devise a measurement of wasted talent and how innovation is helping uh, uh, to bridge you know, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this problem. I think it's, uh, it's going to be very, very, uh, very useful. Um, but let me take a step back. My name is Alberto Di Minin, and I'm primarily a university professor in, uh, in Pisa. And uh, mm, I was very happy to be part. Uh, uh, to this high-level group, uh, uh, mm, it was the first time for me uh, to take part in such a high-level uh, mm, setting, and it was extremely interesting, and I learned so much from this uh, experience. Uh, and uh, um, I would like, uh, so my uh, role uh, in, 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 in this setting is to present to you uh, elements that talk about uh, the relevance of the education system. That was touched upon by Suzanne, and I'll uh, elaborate on that. Uh, but let me um, take uh, Linda's challenge uh, for a moment here and uh, try to get uh, to your attention uh, and capture your imagination, because that's, I think, very important uh, uh, to do in order to put this uh, map into context uh, and uh, to realize that this is not, uh, as the uh, nice follower of Linda suggested, same old, same old, uh, but uh, I think it's something, there is something new here. 
So I'll start with uh, telling you a story. Uh, and from this story, I think there are six lessons learned that relate very well to, the, to Stefan's map here. And the story is uh, uh, the story of a company called NeuronGuard. NeuronGuard is a um, spin-off company, um, a startup company from a university in Emilia-Romagna region, in Italy. Um, NeuronGuard has been founded by two very smart uh, um, persons in their 30s, uh, Enrico, a medical doctor, Mary, a Bocconi MBA student. Um, NeuronGuard brings to market a helmet for treatment of uh, um, hypothermia on site, which means that uh, um, in a situation of uh, acute brain damage, such as a stroke or an accident or these horrible uh, things, uh, um, an ambulance uh, equipped with this system can uh, treat you in a way that, uh, not you, but uh, the, the person that happened to, to, to be in this very unfortunate situation, <coughs> um, freezing down, uh, decreasing the temperature of your brain. Uh, very complicated technology, very sophisticated, uh, not only saves lives, uh, but uh, uh, creates an environment. So basically, the, the brain freezes, uh, goes down to a temperature where, of course, uh, you, you are kept alive, but uh, the stroke, for example, doesn't diffuse uh, as easily as before. And this uh, uh, creates uh, an opportunity to diminish the brain damage and, and, and so on and so forth. We are talking about um, a sector that the, the treatment of active brain damage worldwide is uh, 300 billion every year. 300 billion. A small percentage change, a small percentage saving in this, uh, like a 1% savings, 3 billion every year. So we are talking about a huge, huge market that uh, requires not only innovation, but on also a redesign of uh, an element of uh, uh, the system, such as, for example, ambulance that need to be equipped with uh, uh, such a system. Uh, the entire flow of treatment uh, needs to be redesigned, starting from a technology that is coming out of university. Why am I talking about this technology? Last week, um, 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 this company won a global award uh, given out by uh, Intel. Uh, on uh, It's one of the oldest uh, business plan competition worldwide. They won this uh, award as the best uh, um, business model and, uh, uh, in, in their category. And I think... Uh, this, uh, this story here tells us uh, uh, mm, we can get very important lessons from this story. And uh, uh, there are six elements uh, that I would like to om emphasize with you that relate very well uh, to, uh, to, the, to the map of the high-level group innovation policy management uh, final recommendations. The first one is about open innovation. Uh, you've all heard this. Um, it's, a, it's a buzzword that has been circulating uh, in the industry, in, uh, in industry academia, uh, for, for uh, uh, since 2003, when Henry Chesborough came up with uh, with the book Open Innovation, um, um, one of the elements uh, that uh, that is very important in the open innovation ecosystem is that there is uh, an emphasis, as Susan and Linda has emphasized, on co-development, on um, um, co-location. Uh, the case of Siemens that we were just discussing now uh, is uh, replicated in other settings, and we want uh, more of these situations where big companies engage into an active discussions with university institution, uh, research lab, uh, not only with the front hoovers of the world, but also with areas that are a little bit less, uh, how can I put it in a nice way, inclined to enter in a discussion with industry. Please refer to not uh, 
you know, McKinsey reports, but refer to the editorial of Nature. We all know Nature. We, uh, last uh, week or last uh, month, there was an editorial, uh, uh, Companies on Campus, that of course was emphasizing the difficulties that companies face and universities face engaging in a, in, a, in a dialogue. But this is a dialogue, uh, the editorial was claiming, that can bring uh, a lot uh, of value added for students, for research, and for industry. So this is a, a clear uh, idea. And then the case of Neurongard really showed this because the engagement with public hospitals, the engagement with uh, healthcare organizations was fundamental to co-design and solve in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right way some fundamental problems that was uh, very important in the application of the business model and the technology to um, the, the setting. Second element, uh, the startups, the spin-off companies are a fundamental um, provider in this innovation ecosystem. They are part of uh, the supply side of innovation. They bring to market something. We should not consider them as users of technologies, but as vectors that bring to market technologies. Large companies, um, public sector, need to realize uh, that uh, the, the uh, startups and the entrepreneurial efforts that uh, um, are embedded in these uh, um, these projects uh, can complement can complement uh, their innovation investment. I am uh, uh, very sad when we compare industrial corporate venturing data between Europe and the rest of the world. Industrial corporate venturing, meaning the fact that companies get out and buy innovation from uh, um, startups and, and companies that are starting off bringing to market technology shouldn't be something that we keep hearing Americans telling us how to do. Uh, our uh, European champions uh, need to become, need to be encouraged to buy innovation through uh, these, uh, uh, these vectors. And indeed, uh, if we don't do this, uh, Neurongard will end up be bought uh, by a non-European company, which is good. At the end, as a citizen of the world, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy if I know that the ambulances of the world are equipped with the system, but I would be happier if uh, somehow through this, uh, I provide an answer to young um, uh, people in Europe that can benefit uh, of, uh, of, of the system from also a business perspective. Third aspect, uh, let's not give up on the fact that industrial competitiveness is one dimension, social innovation is a second dimension. We can achieve both. There is a you know, I'm, I'm a professor in, in management, so we always do two by two metrics, uh, and we do like you know competitiveness, low, high, uh, social innovation, low, high, and so we always want to be in the uh, top uh, right quadrant. There is a way to be top uh, top right quadrant. There are very important areas of improvement in health, uh, is indeed one of them, uh, but there are not. Uh, is that that's not the only one? And uh, mm, the so to get back to Linda's uh, point, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, I think that if social innovation is high, I think that's where we can, as Europeans, capture uh, the attention, in, in, in a way, in, in capture the imagination in a, more, uh, in a way that is more uh, in line with the way that Europe uh, is, is probably built, you know, and so, um, I think I think that's the way to go, you know, and, uh, and I think it's 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 a line of thought that uh, it's in um, in line with the idea of building up a, a sustainable and inclusive society. Um, this brings me to a delicate issue, which is Susan has mentioned money. Um, I think that uh, if we are able to direct our resources. Uh, not only on the supply side of innovation, but also on the demand side of innovation. If we are able to use 
smart public procurement in a way that we are steering uh, the attention of our economy, of the attention and the efforts which are limited of our innovation ecosystem towards targets, okay? I think that is very, uh, uh, it's a very important uh, aspect. Um, the way that we might want to do this, and this is like my personal point of view and, and a little bit what is uh, also an element that is becoming um, among, you know, uh, my Italian colleagues quite, a, quite, a, quite an interesting point of view, is uh, to the emphasis on the region, is the emphasis on the smart uh, city, the smart region as, a, a, as, a, as an area where efforts can be, uh, uh, can, uh, can be targeted. You, you think about ambulances, but here we are in DigiConnect, and I think that digital technologies are enabling of a lot of possible ways and possible improvements uh, uh, within uh, the smartness of a local uh, of a local region, which is which goes very much beyond uh, um, digital per se. And I'm saying this because right now Italy is very much uh, in the implementation of the digital agenda is very much behind in this uh, and is very much pushing forward. One element that I think is very interesting and should be uh, quite, uh, uh, um, I think it's a lot of value added, is the emphasis of interfaces. We need to build, build better interfaces between the public sector and the private sector, between Brussels and uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, how about that? If you are able to identify better interfaces, enabled by nice ICT technologies, but that keep users in mind for whatever we do, ambulances, um, Horizon 2020, or, uh, mm, uh, or the way I pay taxes, um, or uh, uh, how do I put my kids in the kindergarten, I think that we can create uh, interesting business models, interesting opportunities for startups and large companies to contribute. Um, a tool that is uh, fundamental, I'm, I'm getting to point five or six, so please bear with me, uh, is something that was extremely emphasized in the, in the report, and it was also uh, the, uh, the inducement, the challenge prices approach. Uh, with DigiConnect, we are now in a, in a project uh, to design uh, um, inducement prices challenges for uh, the ICT world and therefore identify achievable goals uh, uh, that uh, if I identify a sizable price at the end, I can steer, once again, the keyword is steering, the innovation community towards that direction. And I think that's a very interesting tool of policy that has not been used yet enough in Europe continental Europe at least. The UK has been experimenting quite, uh, uh, quite a lot on this and probably um, continental Europe should, uh, should learn uh, to that. Let me get to my uh, sixth point and I think uh, it's where um, linking back to what uh, Susanna said about education. If you read uh, our report, uh, the 2.4, if I'm not mistaken, yes, 2.4 education, uh, education is emphasized at all levels, at all levels of education. This was one of the key elements of, uh, uh, of, of our interpretation of why innovation should be considered quintessential in the uh, innovation ecosystem. There is a triangulation when we talk about education, and the Nuremberg example shows this clearly, like Susan said, between education, research, entrepreneurship. If we put these three pillars together, we get uh, to a form of education which is less uh, what I do in my current practice, the syllabus of, of a course on uh, strategic management, but is more directed toward problem solving, uh, pro sorry, problem solving, um, uh, competence creation. So let's try to redesign aspects of our education system, trying to put uh, internships, um, uh, the creation of startups, but also the, uh, a form of uh, engagement, uh, for example, through doctorate programs, 
where we see industry and uh, university working together. If a company asks me my time to come and speak to a conference, fine, I'll go. But if a company comes and tells me, here's some money to sponsor two PhD students, this company is getting to my core business, and I listen much more carefully, much more carefully as a university professor. Um, let's try to engage, therefore, when we talk about education with companies, academia, startup community, with the right tools, with the right mechanisms that are making the three aspects that we were discussing before um, uh, talk the same language. So to conclude, uh, I think that open innovation uh, is centered around people. Uh, the literature on open innovation has shown the relevance of, on, of people. And people means skill. People means education. People means uh, that the key metrics of success of an innovation um, ecosystem is uh, to avoid uh, waste of talent and the development of the right skills uh, to, get, uh, to, that, uh, to get to these goals. When we talk about smart public procurement, when we talk about the, the type of policies that we can do, let's bring back uh, the discussion about what type of expenditure is R&D, is an expenditure or is an investment. Let's try to bring this back into the discussion on the fiscal compact. Do we really want to treat investment in research and innovation to the same level as any other current spending in our budgets. Let's be clear that this probably is not, uh, is definitely not the way that the Italian president thinks about this, uh, and is definitely not probably a way that we create the tools of risk and the pool of resources to invest into, uh, uh, into, uh, into our future. And finally, uh, from day one, innovation is a global game. And uh, uh, when we look at uh, the heritage that uh, uh, research and innovation programs, in particular Horizon, has left, uh, but also the, the, the kick uh, initiatives and everything, uh, we see this heritage from the previous commission that is coming out uh, and is, is need to be implemented by a new commission, that uh, from day one, our researchers, our innovators, need to think about a global scale. They not, don't think only to innovate at the ambulance system in Emilia Romagna, but they, they, they need to tell me, through this technology, I am changing the game of uh, a, 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 a sector which is 300 billion worldwide. This is what is the type of impact that we expect from innovation. This is the type of game that I, I think we, we, can, we can play together, startups, large companies, um, uh, university, and, uh, and the public sector. Okay, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Alberto, for the excellent reflection also to, to this picture. Any quick question to Alberto? Well, Angelos. I have just to congratulate uh, uh, the last speaker because he concludes what Stefan starts from the beginning. He starts from the strategy and he gives uh, the real dimension approaching the actual uh, situation in the world and in Europe. Because you speak about innovation ecosystem while saying that it's 340 living labs based from, the, from uh, Greece, uh, from, sorry, from Europe. And don't forget that uh, one of the centers of these living labs is in Rome. Uh, so also they are in Amsterdam or they are in... So uh, Europe have the way to go in this very bad situation within the crisis for the growth, new jobs, and human capital revaluation in the new conditions. That's clear. The problem that we have is that we have delay to give the real names to the actors. Innovation means industry. Education means human capital. Human capital plus industry means the whole war 
we have to turn back to the resources. And if you see the big uh, protagonist in this game, you will see the countries that are, have already done that and the countries that they develop that. If you have in the world 340 living lives, not only from the 20 countries of uh, Europe, but also from 24 countries, starting from China and in Canada and South Africa. So Europe have the potential to go fast. But we have, first of all, to see ourselves in the mirror and to understand what we have and what we say that we have. Of course, the human capital in the universities, the professors, the researchers, is a basic element. But they need industry to give the lead. And uh, I am happy that I hear the Italian colleague that he put the things in the earth. The earth is, it is very good, the blue paper that we have. But you have some problems there that have to be examined. IPRs, for example. We know the problem, industry with APRs. We can see that. But we have to say also what is our potential in Europe. We are not in the 60s, the 70s, or the 80s. We are in 2010, 14, and we have all these things happen. There is another problem, Stefan, in your introduction. You speak about European ecosystem. In Europe still, we cannot name a national ecosystem. Don't forget that the works that are done in Sprug by uh, the English uh, uh, researchers, they have as model the national innovation ecosystem, not the continent innovation ecosystem. So it is too early to speak about European innovation ecosystem. Let's try to see if we have national university ecosystems, and if you are going just out of the door in Belgium, in Holland, you will see that. There are the elements of a national innovation ecosystem. That's a good thing. And then we can go to the European one. So you see, there are things that we have arrived, but we have to say the truth. We have a problem of crisis because we don't take as priorities the items that Alberto has said at the end. Which is the real investment that we have to do? Human capital or plain money in the different huh, known cities? I think that's the point. Uh, just, uh, I would like to thank you for pointing out the uh, the Living Lab example because that's a very interesting example, not something that n needs to be studied really deeply. Um, I visited some of them and I noticed the differences between the various uh, um, Living Labs experiences based on local opportunities, resources that they do have available, certain li Living Labs, and others don't have available. And uh, so, to me, let me try and say this, uh, there are elements of what Stefan has said is a European ecosystem. And to get to this European ecosystem, which is maybe a dream, um, I think uh, one of the elements that we need to consider is that how do we get resources to the right uh, um, actors within the ecosystem. One of the recommendations that we emphasize and that my colleagues have discussed about is, po is uh, policy coherence. And policy coherence has to do with the fact that we try and build up, uh, we, we try to, to attack one problem with multiple governance uh, um, uh, levels of the ecosystem, the regional innovation system, the national innovation system, and the European innovation system. So I think that we still need to talk uh, I, 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 I'm totally uh, with uh, Stefan here in the sense that we need to talk to the European ecosyst innovation ecosystem, thinking about, however, the, that we achieve this uh, through, I think, policy uh, coherence. And I think this is a, 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 a critical dimension that needs to be taken into account. <clears throat> can, I, can I add uh, a comment to your remark, which I, I, I share? Uh, when we speak of innovation ecosystems, plural, uh, we should not think in one single dimension. <clears throat> you have in countries which have a poorly developed public ecosystem, highly innovative companies. You have in the same countries highly uh, forward-thinking research centers, universities. So 
what we really see in many European um, countries, member states, is incomplete ecosystems. Where one, where you have a number of elements developed and others insufficiently or not at all. When you then look at uh, the additional, if I may put it this way, or the encompassing European ecosystem, you also see that what all the merits of Horizon 2020, it isn't really anchored in what is already there in member states or in specific business sectors. It's, it's partly, but insufficiently. The same is valid for universities. So what we need to strive at is, in the end, much more bridge building among member states, among business sectors and universities, and between the EU, etc. And this is an effort of policy coherence, of thinking differently, of managing complexity and moving out, as several speakers said, the silo thinking. That's not easy because it involves a collective effort. We cannot say the Commission has to do that, if not member states do it. It's a collective effort, also in business, also in university. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking. Um, let me give an example. Uh, when I speak about complexity management, we are nowhere in Europe. Uh, South Korea has 20 university chairs. The United <coughs> States have the famous Santa Fe Institute with over 150 researchers. The whole of Europe has not even five university chairs in complexity management. So how can you expect in the most advanced fields of science, be it climate or be it ICT, we can cope? How can you expect that we will have spin-off effects from this thinking, which is an evolution from systems thinking, as you know? How can we expect that, that this penetrates, for example, governance tools and methodologies and structures? So we, we have the capacities but we need to organize it, and we need to invest our resources in the right ways and make sure that it benefits the whole single market. That's why we focus on this ecosystem concept. It's bridge building between what we have and then completing it. Thank you. Well, thank you indeed for the question and, and the, the, the comments. Uh, well, I will use the opportunity of us having some time and, and reflect the, the work of the group, re, the report and, and the discussion from, from open innovation perspective. Because of course that is, that is one of, of the elements which you can, you can see in, in the report. Uh, well, we, we prepared for you also the, the leaflet of, of takeaways and, and of course I must say uh, they are rather subjective looked at from, from the open innovation perspective. But again, I, I think the, the recommendations are, are very much highlighted also in the, in the presentations we've heard today. Uh, related to the last question of, of uh, ecosystems versus ecosystem versus national, uh, I think you, you hit the nail with that because the key element in the report is really on the governance, on the processes, how to get the different elements, at least the gradients of the actions aligned, not even, even not, not merged. Uh, because again, in, in ecosystems, uh, uh, you should have, if they are working, you should have all the stakeholders involved as a, in, in, in their active roles ranging from citizens to universities to, to businesses to the public sector seamlessly. And you should have hundreds of different kinds of activities in, in their driving for strong interaction. And, and actu actually, when we look at, at the slide, which is now up, up in front of us, having a flourishing mashup of different angles, creating collisions for, for innovation. Because again, facilitating col collisions 
Well, you could say during, during experiments in real world, what we also reflected a lot in, in the report is actually expect the unexpected, to create something new. Because again, what is evident in, in the current situation is, is that we cannot just extrapolate the past. We need to do things in, in a new way create new interdisciplinary collisions, create new collisions, well, you could say sparks, it sounds better, between the different stakeholders and different, different ideas. Uh, in, in the work of, of New Club of Paris, which is a think tank on uh, uh, intangible economy, they have concluded in, in some of their reports that uh, the critical thing for national competitiveness is the structural intellectual capital, not the intellectual capital as such, because it's not dynamic, it's not interacting, but really the structural intellectual capital, how the different kind of competences interact and, and complete each other's is the key. And of course, when reflecting that to the horizon 2020, that's one of of the design challenges of, of the new Horizon 2020 work program. We have a new approach, as, as most of you know, but does it go far enough? Do we go with, with that kind of, of activity into the real world where we see fast failures, but also fast successes, which then can be scaled up? Do we have that kind of, of design in the, in the governance systems which allow risk. I think that is one big question because, well, very often the financial controllers are in, in power. Very often. Well, I come from, from a national, originally from a national innovation system and, and know very well the, the mentality. <coughs> Is it easier on, on European level or, or more difficult? Well, anyway, it's needed to, 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 to embed the risk into the design of the activities. Because then when we expect the unexpected, then we can also reflect that into to our policy making. Uh, coming from, from DG Connect, it's, it's rather, well, obvious to say that uh, we are mo changing into an entirely new world with different kind of interrelations uh, where we see parallel structures both in time and place happening. And though all the old designs have been for a very linear, very monolithic kind of, of action, from systems perspective, can one-dimensional systems be optimal for multi-dimensional? I doubt. So again, we are, are shaping entirely new world. Uh, you have been distributed also when you arrived a white paper on, on Open Innovation 2.0, uh, which has 20 snapshots in one of its graphs. And I must say that those 20 snapshots are very much reflected also in this picture. Creating a common vision, having all the stakeholders involved, and then I would say operationally going down to, to what has been, been here reflected. Still one, one remark when we speak about competencies. In, uh, in, a, well, in, in the German Leonardo Award, Learning Award ceremony this year, there were quite a strong and interesting discussion on, on new skills what are needed. And uh, what are the key competences which companies, public sector, academia, should, should put a lot more emphasis on. And there were two new professions identified. The bridgers, 
those kind of people who create the collisions between different disciplines and make things happen, who are by nature curious about absolutely everything and bring in their creative minds well, positive ignition of, of totally even crazy ideas. And then the curators who are taking care of the contents, of the solid contents which then the bridges are, are bringing together. Do we have these kind of T-shaped people and I-shaped people in our organizations? Do they have distinct roles? Do we have I would say those kind of people who can create the new, new governance systems is, I think, one of the, the key questions. Do we have people who have guts to make qualified guesses? Or do we continue just to plan everything ready for yesterday, as we are famous for in Europe? Uh, with this, I, I actually would like to to ask all the panelists, all the presenters, a question. What would your recommendations be to make the report a reality in Europe, in your own country, <coughs> or integrated? Stefan, please. OK, I, I will start with Al Alberto then. Well, um Bro, I mean, I'm not saying this only because I'm in DigiConnect, because it's like it, uh, it's weird. Uh, but I, um, in my in my role, uh, as I said before, I'm uh, most uh, most of the time I'm university professor, and what we are doing right now, uh, um, it's uh, so I think. Let me take a step back. Taking part of this high level group uh, to me shaped uh, the mind of the people that uh, were part of this, uh, of this group. As, uh, as Linda was saying, uh, we did not agree on all these recommendations. We took uh, um, part of an, a discussion. Uh, and, uh, and as part of the discussion, I think it shaped the way uh, we uh, uh, identified uh, the priorities on how investing our times as uh, uh, public uh, uh, government official, as uh, managers of uh, companies, and as uh, uh, academicians. S in my mind, uh, what uh, I see for myself uh, um, as a role is um, to um, expand the type of investment Europe uh, is making on the demand side of innovation. Uh, this uh, talks uh, about uh, um, inducement prices, and as, as I said before, uh, we need to experiment uh, urgently on this uh, uh, tool that is, first of all, capturing the imagination. Second, is uh, uh, consistent with the idea that there is a wisdom of a crowd that can contribute and can engage in, uh, in ways that we would not expect, in ways that uh, uh, give us the exactly you know the, the, the thing that you were saying before the unexpected results and uh, uh, in in ways that truly uh, empower empower researchers empowers creative people empower uh, mm, you know geeks uh, out there that can contribute and we are starting to do this in the ICT uh, sector within horizon there was a, a pilot project that we are uh, currently working on to develop uh, um, 10 uh, challenge prices within ICT, and this is going to be a, a very big prog program for me um, uh, next year. Uh, in, uh, at a higher level of governance, I think uh, that uh, this uh, is expensive. Okay? So uh, if there is one priority that I think we need to encourage our governments uh, to think uh, is to consider in a different way, the type of money that goes into R&D investment uh, different from current uh, public administration spending. Um, I would like to come from another angle. If I could choose or if I could decide of what to do now with uh, this report and the findings, I come from a contradiction that people of my age are currently 
doing politics, are in the administration. And what I miss is that our young people from the age of, let's say, 18 or 20 are really engaged in discussions and really also take over responsibility. I mean, Alexander the Great was 20, I think, where he mm -hmm. had his, his, gray, his greatest, uh, let's say, um, uh, wars to, to lead. And we, in a way, our young people are kept in a, in a kind of, you know, a system where they don't really take over responsibility and they are not even asked. And when you see in an, in an aging society in like, like Germany is, it's like the, the average age of people to decide is 50 or whatever. And so my wish would be to engage much more the younger generation into discussions and also in the implementations, if this would be possible. And what I would, will do in practical is, is to, to encourage uh, some, uh, let's say, university professors to, to, to take this as a blue, this blueprint uh, and to bring it forward to their students and say, can you do anything with this? Is this in your mind? Is this something that is in, of interest for you? And what would we be your solutions to those kinds? This is a thing that I would like to do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take some elements of what was said here today, because I like the idea of um, experimentation. I've actually moved from a policy department to our enterprise agency, um, because, as I said in my last um, slide, we, we just need to get the work done right now. There's, there's work to do, and we just need to get it done, stop making plans, but invest work, experiment. Um, so I was thinking, I would like this idea of inducement price that Alberto mentioned um, and apply it to a European project that inspires and captures the mind. I mean, one thing that I love at the moment is this student from Delft University who has this grand idea for cleaning the oceans of all this plastic soup, which is a huge problem and has no real owner right now. Why, why could Europe not be the owner of this problem and solve it? But I, I do believe in um, people, so I would like to involve uh, the crowd um, sort of in terms of selecting who should win this prize, crowd sourcing, but also the funding, crowd using crowdfunding yeah. much yeah. more because I don't know who said it earlier, you know, oh yeah, you in your education, yeah. students vote with their feet, people yeah. vote with their money, um, let them um, put their money in where they think it's most valuably spent. In the Netherlands, there is a small company that's called Battle of Concepts, uh, just about using students much more actively. Uh, <coughs> and this is about, as, as a, a company or, or a government administration, you can say you you can say you want to bring something further. You're looking for ideas, and they use a student network to um, to come up with ideas. It could be a single student, it could be a group of students. Um, it's not part of their study per se. It could be something that's totally unrelated to their uh, study discipline. Um, and the best subject wins a, a prize, but also points. This point system gives them more. Uh, visibility in the system and so future employers um, can say hey this is a creative uh, creative idea they, they they're also able to write it up in a sensible way make it into a proposal and it's actually found that students who participate in this find it easier to to get a job because they already have introduction to to businesses so I think that from from a combination of different recommendations this would be my proposal I obviously support what the members of the group say. Uh, I, I would like to add a, a fourth uh, element. Um, Ezekiel Dror, the man who invented the concept of central minds of government, he has written about how change processes can happen. The first step in any change process is brainstorming, is thinking out of the box. The second step is that those who have become convinced of the new ideas bridge to others. 
in all directions within the various interlocking systems, in this case, business, government, commission, uh, uh, university, just name it. The third stage is that one wins over those who doubt. And the fourth stage is that one implement the new ideas with, by changing, by letting evolve existing structures, be they business structures, be they university, be they governance structures, commission structure, or whatever. So what we have here is really only the beginning of a process which probably, if one listens to <laughs> President Juncker, is the main work for the next five years, a process of change, a process of evolution in a new direction whereby the uh, European institutions, which have played such an, an important role in the past, adapt their role to 2020-2030. We had in one session a foresight uh, discussion with OECD experts, and our horizon was 2030. And so spreading the ecosystem concept idea, I think, is something I would very much like to see happening. In addition, I think there is room for further um, tripartite work, uh, platforms like the Open Innovation Platform on each of the three main uh, areas in here, the, 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 the governance, the competitiveness, and the social innovation. The work is not finished. This was a set of uh, general recommendations. You can think of, and in the report you have sub-recommendations, but you can think of quite a bit of further development of this. So these are my two wishes. Thank you for asking them. Well, I, I thank all the presenters, and, and now uh, we are moving to the more informal part. We have two choices. Uh, and I suggest we take both. Uh, first, some quick, quick questions here, and then we move to, to the uh, foyer because uh, everything is, is ready there for us already. So some quick questions. Hans, please. Yes, thank you. Um, the report covers a lot of ground, <clears throat> certainly, and um, I was thinking... Um, in implicitly a lot, a number of aspects of policy instruments are being discussed, also in talks that you had, for example, related to innovation and so on. So, for example, one of you mentioned uh, educational instruments, um, uh, research campuses and so on. So these instruments have emerged from the regional and national level. And um, how to move them to the European level, how to align these instruments at the European level. That would be one question. A lot has been done on that, but I would like to hear from you what kind of priorities you would see, what type of instruments could be widened to the European level. For SMEs, for example, that's a word which I did not hear very much from your side. SMEs, the relevant innovation ecosystem for SMEs is no longer regional or local. It's global. So what kind of instruments do we need to facilitate that? Especially the SMEs that are still small, but promising in terms of growth, how to support them? I think that's one of the biggest problems we have. And I was a bit surprised that, that these types of issues were not really very well covered. So one is, can we, because SMEs are so innovative, many of them, I think they would dedicate a bit more attention. Um, do you think that the current instruments are sufficient? Are you satisfied with the current instruments, both at the national level and at the EU level? Or should things change? And what kind of changes will you have in mind? And how to start with the first steps? Well, I think we can collect some questions now. So, John. Actually, I'd like to add to the previous speaker's point. I was thinking the same thing as I was listing up. 
was going through my mind was the, was the parallel work that we're doing at the moment on digital single market. And it suddenly struck me, you know, you're talking about thinking outside the box and having new ideas. Single market. I mean, how old is single market? The very concept of thinking about a digital single market implies thinking of a European single market, which is a patent absurdity. The current e-commerce trade figures, for example, are 85% is bought into Europe and only 15% is sold up the pipe. So, I mean, this, this gentleman has made the point about, about SMEs being global. One of the things I think maybe a false start you guys have made is to identify a European open innovation system. European? I mean, surely in 2014, when you're speaking global, it's a global innovation system. Maybe rather than artificially building a border around Europe, and all borders are artificial, surely, in an information society, maybe you should have been thinking about how best we exploit a global innovation system. There's something quite old-fashioned about everything I've heard here today, something quite that just is, is wrong. Like I say, it sounds digital single market, it sounds unisex hairdresser, it sounds roller disco. It's, it's just wrong. Uh, Elisa Molino from um, IBM. Um, I wanted to come back to the issue of governance and uh, and try and align to um, um, a couple of um, issues uh, um, of the European agenda. Um, so we have a new commission, so this was also mentioned. Um, it has been said by some analysts that indeed innovation has become much more of a priority um, for the new commission because also the distribution of the different portfolios. So I was wondering whether the speakers have any position on this, whether you think that is really the moment to act has been recognized also by the commission and they will be able to um, uh, to implement, let's say, bold um, uh, policy uh, policy solution which, which take consideration into account. And this also links to uh, something uh, I believe is important to see innovation as really horizontal across the different policy doses, and this was mentioned in, in a number of issues, and not only re related to R&D, but uh, of course it's, it's not only about R&D investment, but it's much broader than that. Um, and. Um, Maybe among the um, uh, among the issues that um, influence innovation um, is the what are the frame and conditions, the regulatory conditions. I also saw in your report that you do address this point, um, and you also spoke about the impact assessment. And there was just a, a consultation on the revision of the impact assessment guidelines uh, a few months ago, and. I guess the results and actions will be taken uh, forward by the new commission. So I wonder if uh, um, you see this uh, revision as an opportunity to um, address some of the solutions you've proposed in the impact assessment to take more into consideration innovation, the impact that any legislation would have in innovation, and if yes, how do you actually measure the impact on innovation of, of any legislation, if you have any idea. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Adam and I'm a trainee. Um, I suppose one of the thoughts that I was having, um, I come from a humanities background, but I was very fortunate to have um, also done some courses on innovation um, that were put on um, through consortium of Irish universities. Um, and they had innovated around the idea of educating about innovation. So people like me, lucky pups, were allowed to um, bring more classical creative uh, backgrounds to the fore, uh, among other scientists who were doctoral students too. Um, and we were allowed and we were given time to play, which is a crucial uh, part of innovation. Uh, maybe, maybe, I suppose, one of the questions that I would like to ask is, where is this element of play? Um, it's the opposite of policy maybe for some people, maybe it's not for others. But I suppose the other question here is, is key, and it's to do with education. We must invest in universities, but not in the traditional university structure. So if there are to be companies involved, how do we make sure that these companies involved are not only serving their particular sector, not only the sciences, not only industry? Because I see the future for humanity is looking completely doomed 
um, albeit crucial for creativity in the classical sense and innovation in the modern sense. Um, and this is something that is, it's, it's, a, it's a genuine question, and I think, I think um, I'd be very interested in any of your responses um, towards this kind of point. Carlos Ben from University of Coimbra and guest professor at U Delft. Um, I really like your uh, presentations, but uh, there is one that I really like strongly, uh, the presentation from Linda, and um, in which concerns to the something that I think is at the core, that is about openness and transparency. And I would add also uh, credibility. Credibility in the sense that uh, people really think that, okay, the institutions are open, are transparent, uh, have competence, and uh, governance based on evidences. Uh, and I, I, I really think that this is uh, at the core of uh, uh, improving and going behind our current situation in terms of, of uh, trusting the institutions, trusting universities, trusting enterprises, trusting the system that is about these aspects of openness and transparency. So. I really would like to, 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 to understand from your positions uh, definitely the role that you think that the open data, crowdsourced data, and all these things related to openness have in all this process, and how they relate also to the current programs on H2020, how, we, how this is uh, being said. Yes, maybe more common than a question. May Latane from uh, EARTO is the European Association of Research Centers in Europe. Um, actually, much more positive than some of the comments you got. I think this is quite good that for once we are discussing innovation ecosystem. I think replacing the title ERA by a European innovation ecosystem would be much better than what we have in ERA. Probably we'll, we'll skip some of the gender issues and really looking at uh, what the policy and uh, innovation policy management should be. So I think if that helps to retitle the activities we have, please yes do. Um, maybe to mention something and uh, why I'm quite positive on your on your report and especially on the small summary that you made. Uh, EARTO has published two weeks ago some recommendation. For those who don't have them, I have some copy uh, outside. And we came to two conclusions, which I think maybe it sounds uh, old-fashioned and uh, not innovative enough, but I think sometimes you need to repeat your message. I think sometimes understanding takes time. Exactly the same than uh, looking at the results, what uh, Linda says, to have innovation programs and show the impact. Uh, now uh, the uh, innovation programs in the Netherlands show their impact while they have been killed some few years back. Uh, and that's a pity. So sometimes uh, supporting innovation ecosystem takes time. and. Uh, supporting those ones needs to be done over and over and over again, and proving our case is not always very easy. When I look at your two recommendations, um, the first one, you're very much looking at the complexity of this ecosystem and how the different actors are playing with each other. I think this needs some training to understand what, uh, who are those actors we see, and in my job every day, I have to explain again and again what a research center can do. Uh, which is not academia, which is not industry, and has a very particular uh, uh, job to do. But if it's not supported, we won't have them in 25 years' time, which I think is one of the key of Europe. They don't have them in the US, but they are creating them in Canada. So I've been discussing, and I'm asked all around Euro the world now, to discuss what is the model of the ecosystem we have in Europe. We don't work that bad. So we should not always shoot in our feet telling that our models are not so bad. I think sometimes we're doing uh, quite good. And if I look at the Canada, they are turning uh, their National Research Council uh, 90 degrees uh, and going to become a new RTO. And I had the discussion with our minister last week on how the RTO models and the innovation ecosystem with the different actors, with the industry, with the academia, and with the RTOs were working, and why we were so successful in certain areas. So sometimes everything new, I don't really agree. Uh, sometimes taking time in invest in what you already invested for and looking at your return of investment will be quite key. Something that... Um, I see also on your governance. For us, we looked at this much more, uh, not on the side of the governance itself. I mean, we're not the policymaker, but much more on what is the impact you get out of the money you are investing. 
which I think was your underlying question, and I think this will be uh, the job of the Commission to prove that investment made in the structural funds on innovation and in Horizon 2020 will impact. Uh, national ministries are already asked to do that many often. You had a few comments on the different uh, policy you have at national level. But I think this is where you have to show that the uh, policy you have on ecosystem will function and how you will get that. And I think here you will need to have the actors on the table, so not only the policy maker, which I think most of you are in your high-level group, but probably make your high-level group continue its work by discussing with the actors in the ecosystem to see how can you derive that really in practical instruments and where are the other actors in those systems can support you further. And I think probably some more dialogues with the uh, actors of the innovation ecosystems will probably be the next steps for you. So uh, the offer is there to be taken. I'll go first then. Um, so my name is Stefan. I work at Prospects. We're a small consultancy here in Brussels. We're no lobbyists, thank God, uh, but we specialize in stakeholder engagement. Um, so it really gives me a warm feeling inside when I hear so many people today talking about, you know, the need to, to reach out to stakeholders. Um, I don't want to talk about this though, unfortunately, but I do want to talk about what was raised several times as well this idea of the digital single market and it's also being addressed in the report I believe. So we talk about you know data protection, we talk about copyright, you know last year before the elections we were um, trying to get through the connected content regulation in the European Parliament so we have all these ideas of, of harmonizing legislation um, and to at least you know create this ecosystem for for our companies, European companies or European champions to, you know, get this potential for economies of scale. I mean, we talked about this today as well, you know, are, your, are European champions, where are they? Um, and I think they're conspicuous, conspicuously absent at this point. My point is, you know, when it comes to these kind of policy issues, the ones you raised in the report as well is, they've been postponed and postponed again and again, and I think the key issue here is we need to ask more of our policy makers, our decision makers. Um, and this is, a, speaking from a personal point of view here, is that member states for the most part have been postponing any kind of, um, you know, breakthroughs on these legislative files. So uh, that's something I just wanted to get off my chest. But thank you for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. And then the final, final. Oh my God, pressure on me. Um, hi, my name is Jero. I'm a national contact point for Belgium for Horizon 2020. I work for Walloon Business Federation. Actually, it's more a follow-up of the previous previous speaker that I'd like to say is, justly, uh, um, concretely, what do we do now? Uh, we hear your recommendation, what you have said, and you have a roadmap on the last two page of your of the blueprint. But as it's written, it's suggested. So. Concretely, what do we do now? What is the next step? When do you need RTOs? When do you need the university to step in? When do we need to mobilize our stakeholders to, to jump with you, to get in touch with you? And what is concretely, and I, I really insist concretely, the next step now? Thank you. Well, thank you for those questions. And, and then, well, free order, who takes what? And then we hope that we cover everything. Okay, very quick. I, uh, uh, I capture three uh, keywords uh, in your, uh, and I'll leave uh, the other issues to be addressed by my uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, SME, play, and time. Uh, SMEs. Uh, mm, it was uh, only an accident that it was, they were not mentioned in the, because of the division of uh, labor that we decided just to, before coming here. Uh, let me emphasize that SMEs are uh, indeed, a uh, pivotal element of these uh, uh, recommendations, just to make clear, for example, if you read 1.6, the public procurement uh, um, uh, recommendation, uh, he, there it says uh, very clearly, identifies the role of, U, uh, of uh, SMEs in, uh, in the ecosystem and uh, identifies them as potential lead users of innovation 
to take kind of like tackle and, and take to market through public procurement uh, uh, new new forms of innovation. So SMEs are definitely present. I am uh, the Italian representative for SMEs in Horizon, and I'm telling you that uh, what is, what is happening right now is that we are seeing a lot of new first timers uh, 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 taking part to framework program initiatives. 20% um, of Horizon budget is going to be dedicated to SMEs. Um, the innovation support uh, uh, um, uh, tools that are present in Horizon are giving us exactly clear indications that uh, what is happening uh, is uh, uh, that companies that are not traditionally, you know, uh, they are market leaders in their sector, uh, are taking the opportunity to consider science and technology innovation as uh, potential elements for their competitive advantage, for renewal sources of potential uh, for their competitive advant uh, advantage. Two of the Italian winners, to give you examples, concrete example, one is an iron casting fifth generation family firm that is using uh, money from Horizon to uh, engage in uh, to research activity with the Polytechnic of Milan. Another one is a tile manufacturing company, tile manufacturing, that is using uh, laser engraving technologies uh, to, uh, 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 to take to market uh, uh, new uh, new approaches for for tiles. I think that's so. Th that's what we uh, and and I'm not starting to talk about digital well, because the 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 fact that uh, um, uh, these technologies, science and technology, can be an enabling factor uh, for competitiveness of SMEs in uh, uh, um, uh, in their respective uh, sectors. So not talking only about high tech. And I'm coming from a country where. It still is, you know, uh, we, we are one of the largest manufacturers of the world and we need to keep focusing on our traditional industry. The point is, what I'm trying to insist on is that science and technology can be an um, element for success and competitive advantage for traditional industry. Uh, second comment, uh, the, the play dimension is very important in my mind to uh, get surprised on, on the result. Uh, that we are, are, are getting um, from innovation. And play should be really like a, a keyword in the way that we redesign our uh, uh, education, our innovation policies. Now, I'm, not so, I'm not so sure if we can use that word uh, with government changing, but uh, maybe. Uh, playing, play with the concept, contaminate, uh, create, create uh, contamination environments where we see uh, crowd mechanism engaged in with uh, you know uh, professors and uh, industry. So let be surprised about uh, uh, the results through uh, this uh, display dynamic. Uh, our um, again, let me give you a concrete example: uh, the Maker Fair initiative that is taking place all over Europe. Our uh, digital champion in Italy, Riccardo Luna, is a key promoter of this Maker Fair initiative. It's fantastic. You see kids from kindergarten up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, retirees people that play with this, uh, uh, this concept. And I think it's really engaging and it's actually a democratizing in Open Innovation 2.0 at uh, full speed. Uh, that is taking place. Finally, I think that whatever we choose to do, I, I strongly agree with Linda, it's the time now to, um, to make policies that are resilient with respect to time, because it takes time to, uh, to see the results of an education or an innovation uh, policy. If we keep changing gears every time, we have a problem. We do have horizons right now. Let's stick with the implementation to horizon. Let's try not to be distracted by other concepts uh, to before claiming that uh, we got to the wrong result or the train needs to, needs to be uh, needs to change direction, and I think this is a temptation that, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it's very uh, it's very easy to uh, to fall. Continue. Um, two points I would like to stress. The one is um, relates to <coughs> not nothing new in this report are a bit about the criticism. The second is also about humanities and education and things like that. I want to support what was said um, to be a more, more optimistic and more positive side. One of the group's findings was 
we would like to keep to a kind of European model, even in a globalized world, because to be very frank, uh, there may be countries be more innovative and be more open to digital or whatever, but do we want to live in those countries? Would you like to live in South Korea or in the States? I, I, I have my doubts. Europe is, is, has many advantages, and we could, what we are, have to do is to preserve these advantages in being uh, on the global front as well. So, second, uh, I always say the greatest obstacle to uh, innovation and to, let's say, to, to a step forward is human being. Because we may be, our minds may be very, very uh, advanced, but emotionally we are still in the Stone Age. And that's where I come to humanities and their role. I mean, you have to take people aboard when you, ha when you want to have change. And I miss uh, the humanities in their role as being an advisor for ethical questions, for example. And I have not heard the voice of humanities uh, in many terms be discussing real societal problems and being very heard of. Germany was one of the countries to say in, in Horizon 2020, we have to have a strong role for humanities and social sciences. But they also have to have a kind of Bringschuld. Uh, I mean, they also have to contribute to advise people how to deal with the changes. When you look at a, a subject like social freezing, this is a very crucial ethical question. Do I want my daughter to have a child when she's 50 after a big career? These are the questions that we have to discuss in society. And do we want to have all applications that are, that are uh, possi possible? Uh, I don't know if you have read the book, The Circle. If you're not, I, I would like to, you to read it. It's uh, about a company like Google and what happens to people working there. I mean, it's a fiction, but it's very interesting. I really can advise you to read it. And so this is what I would like to say on the one hand, of course, we, uh, you can say everything is very critical and, German, and, and Europe is, is a lot behind everything, but there's another side of the, and, and people want to, in 100 years, people still want to lead a decent life. And that's where the questions where we, we as politicians have to tackle. And this is one of the big questions that we are um, just trying to find solutions for the next 20 or 30 years, and this, that's not easy. We need your help. A um, lot of questions. Some have hopefully been answered already. Um, I think I will, there was a question uh, about the new commission. Um, did we have an opinion about it? Well, like I said, I think already the, the organization of the new commission, uh, if it works the way I think Mr. Juncker has planned it, is very promising. I know there has been some disappointment um, about the role of research and innovation in, in when you look at the picture of the organization chart for the new commission, and the fact that it's all uh, very much connected to jobs and growth, I think it just reflects uh, today's reality. Europe is not a very popular uh, idea for, for many citizens at the moment. The Danish uh, lady was talking about youth unemployment, um, mm -hmm. which is a huge, huge social problem. So it's all very well to talk about fundamental science and the importance, and of course it is very important, but I think uh, it's just been chosen for a very pra pragmatic <coughs> uh, agenda for the next five years which with, with a lot of uh, actual uh, topical uh, problems that we have in Europe right now, whether we like it or not. So I think um, research and innovation as tools for competitiveness and growth, I think to me, it seems a, a reasonable agenda. I think uh, I think Ayarto was very pleased when they read the uh, the mission letter from Mr. Juncker to uh, to Mr. Mudas. Uh, certainly, from the Minister of Economic Affairs, we were pleased because there is a lot of emphasis on impact, on applied research. So <laughs> you probably did a good job in uh, talking to him. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think that it, it, there's a lot of promise in this new commission for the next five years. Uh, there was uh, about impact of innovation, which I discussed in my presentation. Um, we need to give it time, but also you do need to uh, look at impact. This is something we failed to do in Dutch policy in the past. I mean, we thought the, the innovation programs were excellent. They were um, supported by the political system of the time. The prime minister was chairing 
uh, in an innovation platform, and they came up with the idea for these programs. So we thought we were, we had the political uh, commitment, uh, and then of course the, the the politics change and the commitment's gone. And then if you haven't thought up front about how do we demonstrate that it has had an impact or will have an impact, then uh, <laughs> you know it's just this one big uh, strike through and, and you're out. So now in our policy making there was a big there was a, an expert working group and um, they've come up with uh, evaluation measures uh, ex ante uh, and ex post um, mm -hmm. on, on how to deal with the impact of, yeah. uh, of policy. Uh, we are experimenting with this approach. I, I know that the first uh, review, the evaluation we did of Eureka Eurostars has been very, very difficult. They tried to a, a, apply a particular econo econometric uh, methodology, which uh, turned out we didn't, we, we didn't have the data present because uh, it was never upfront thought that we would need that kind of data. So we're learning from this process now uh, and, uh, and you know, also with our new enterprise policy and our top sectors. From the start, we have thought about how do we measure progress, how do we measure what results we want to uh, to get out of it, and, and how do we demonstrate we are getting those results. So in terms of the communication, uh, also we have had to, to learn a hard lesson there. So now each year we have a reporting cyclus to members of parliament and, and, and the public at large about what we do and what the progress has been. So that's about impact of innovation. Um, Element of play has been discussed. Old-fashioned, uh, European. Uh, well, I think um, you know you have to start with what you you have some kind of influence on. Not a, a huge deal, but national and European policy making is something that w is within our grasp. But clearly, business are, are not uh, thinking on a European scale. Uh, although, like I said, I think for a lot of businesses, Europe is still their starting ground. So if we offer them a fertile uh, starting basis there, and then at least it gives them a good position to go global, which is, um, you know, also to our advantage. Um, instruments has been touched upon, I think. Uh, concretely, next step, always tricky, of course, because it was a very diverse group. Uh, so I'll take it to the personal level again. Like I said, I, s I switched to our enterprise uh, agency where I'll be advising I'm a national contact point now for Horizon 2020 for climate action. So I'm hoping to make a more uh, concrete uh, contribution to, uh, to projects, uh, project mm -hmm. ideas, and taking businesses further uh, with their ideas. Uh, I think at the national level, uh, the steps we are taking uh, is smart industry, which I know is being done in Germany as well, is now a big topic. So industry. Reindustrialization at European level is uh, is is a big uh, topic as well. Um, robotization, I said, innovation quite often it creates jobs, of course, but it also destroys jobs as well. I mean, Philips relocated re uh, a, a factory from making shavers to the Netherlands. Um, their employment is probably a tenth of what they would have had in the past, uh, but the jobs they have now are much more qualified um, uh, jobs. So that's an effect of, of much more automated manufacturing. Uh, but at the same time, we've started a discussion, like Susanna was saying, you, you constantly try to learn and develop. So there is now a social discussion about the impact of automation mm -hmm. and, and, and the loss of jobs it will create and, and how do we, as a society, deal with it. I mean, I, I know there is a report that says any job can be replaced by computers yeah. or robots. You know, even we as intellectual uh, workers uh, will be replaced by robots. So what does that mean? Does, does nobody work anymore in, in the future? Um, you know, as an ultimate concept. And, and what does that mean for policy today and how we deal with it as society? So um, I hope that gives some answers to the question. Thank you. Just uh, three short additional comments uh, on impact assessment guidelines. They clearly fall short of the recommendations made by the high-level group. They follow traditional thinking, uh, uh, or thinking goes much further. 
on SMEs, the best way to help SMEs, the best way to help SMEs in Europe. First, a correction. There is in Brussels often grand talk about SMEs uh, and innovation. We must realize that only a very small percentage of small and medium-sized companies are in innovation. The rest are into plumbing and all sorts of similar service deliveries. They are not innovators. But those who are truly innovators, startups and, uh, and the likes, they need one thing above everything else, and that's better regulation. SMEs in Europe are killed in their growth by the regulatory burdens. A large company can cope with it. They have an army of lawyers, etc. Small companies simply cannot. And that is the problem. And it's, it's a problem of the EU. The complexity and the burden and the, of European uh, regulation. It's a problem of member states applying it in a very rigid way, often pressed to be rigid by uh, European Commission or agencies. And then to make it all worse, in some countries you have the gold plating by regional governments. That's the problem of SMEs. And no funding and no mm, will help them to overcome that. Because you fund something which takes a grand start and then hits a regulatory wall. And that's a reality we must start to see. And incidentally, the regulatory burden now on the large multinationals starts to create a problem for us. And the problem is not Europe's drive towards sustainability or other uh, very uh, laudable social goals. The problems are the methods used to achieve desirable outcomes, which is why we have put um, uh, resilience thinking, which is really complexity management, uh, co-governance uh, at, at the heart of our recommendations. We need to find new methods to achieve desirable outcomes. And then a final and third comment. Uh, I think the whole group uh, was indeed uh, driven by what Susanna called a European model approach. Um, digital is, uh, we, we surely will have, will, we cannot avoid being influenced by digitalization, but I think there was nobody in the group who wanted to be determined by digitalization. And this, this, is, something, this is something different uh, with regard to new technologies. Um, I would like to leave it at that, uh, uh, Broer, because otherwise the discussion will continue and we are keen for the reception. <laughs> yes, you, you mentioned the two key points. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we have the possibility to continue the discussion over there in, in the foyer <coughs> after just a couple of small remarks because I think they are related more, more to the Commission. Uh, first of all, regarding the framework, uh, re regulatory actions, uh, policies, etc., I would refer to, to what Zoran Stancic said in, in, in the beginning. It's up to us very much now internally also to bring the report uh, operationally to political decision makers within our organizations to the new cabinets because they have now been established and embedded that in, into the policies. In, in larger scale, we clearly have recommendations uh, which you could say already are, are being reflected even in, in the Commission structure. For the second uh, very practical question, what to do now, uh, I, I really think that if you read the report, if you get thoughts on that, if you are resonating with that, or I would say if there is clear dissonance, let us know. Because again, as said, it's, it's, it's really about aligning, bridging, reflecting on, on this paper. Probably the easiest way is, is to, to contact me or, well, I, and, and then, then the comments will go for, forward in, in the group as well. Uh, because it, at the end, it's, it's about building a, a common vision on what to do, how to do, and, and uh, not necessarily to do one policy experiment, but we can do several policy experiments in, in the near future of, of different kind of behaviors, different kind of alignments, 
uh, will we create a, for instance, uh, supporting platforms for positive coaching? Because again, in, in, in governance issues, in, in policy creation, uh, usually people want to invent the things themselves. So again, positive coaching might be the tool. But as said, really, reflections to us, thoughts, uh, everything is, is really welcomed in the spirit of openness and, and transparency. Thank you for your participation so far, and, uh, and please continue the discussion outside in the foyer. Thank you. And thank you for the <laughs> contributors, speakers as well. Okay. Yes.